This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. His compassion fail not. It is new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Bible tells us, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to him, trust in him, and he will do it. For we know that God calls in all things, the good and the bad, to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his predetermined plan. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I want to welcome y'all here um, this morning to Grace uh, Bible Ministry. Before we begin our worship, we always like to spend a few moments to prepare ourselves to make sure that God is able to speak to us. If you will, open your Bible um, quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in preparation for our worship this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14 through chapter 3, verse 1. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of the flesh, as to infants in Christ. People come in four sizes. What we see here in 1 Corinthians is how men interact with spiritual things. As a believer in Jesus Christ and as a individual part of the human race, you interact with God's truth in one of these ways. Here in verse 14 through 3-1, we have four types of people in our world. The first type of person in our world is in verse 14. He's called a natural man. The natural man is the man without Christ, without hope, the man who do not have God's spirit living in him because he has rejected Jesus Christ as his savior. And this man may read the Bible, but cannot interact with the truth of the Bible because he do not have the spirit of God living in him. And then in verse 15, we have another type of man called the spiritual man. The spiritual man is the man who is a believer in Jesus Christ, and he has the spirit living in him, but the spirit is controlling him. And when the spirit is controlling a believer, then that believer can interact with spiritual things. And then in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, we have another type of man, and that is a man of the flesh. A man of the flesh is a Christian, is a believer, but a believer who is not controlled by God's spirit, but a believer who is controlled by his flesh or his sin nature. That man, though he have the spirit, he cannot interact with spiritual things, because he's in the flesh instead of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then you have another type of believer, and he's called an infant in Christ. This is a believer who is immature in spiritual things, also because he is under the control of the sin nature. The reason I went here this morning, because you're either a natural man, a spiritual man, or you're a man of the flesh, or an infant in Christ. In other words, if you're here and the Holy Spirit of God who lives in every believer is not controlling you or influencing you, you cannot interact with spiritual things today. So what we like to do before we worship and before we study God's word is give you the opportunity to restore fellowship with God if fellowship has been broken. The Bible say, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and clean us from all unrighteousness. Every time you as a believer sin, you grieve God's spirit that lives in you. And when his spirit is grieved, he cannot control you and he cannot help you understand spiritual things. 
So we always like to spend a few moments of silent prayer before our worship to give you the opportunity to tell God that you are confessing your sin so that you can be ready to interact with spiritual things. With that being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity that we have to gather, to worship you, to, to learn about you, and to learn your plan for our lives. We know that we cannot learn, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, he wanted to speak, but he could not speak because those he wanted to speak to was in the flesh, and therefore they could not interact with the things that he was teaching. So we ask of you to clean us from all sin that we have committed both knowingly and unknowingly so that we can be able to worship you and be able to interact with your truth as you seek to teach us through your spirit and through your word. So we ask you to clean us from all sin, sanctify our heart so that we can worship you in spirit and be able to interact with spiritual things. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. If you will, we'll stand and begin with worship and song. 
your children. And that's a promise from you. And I thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you are joining us for the first time, we have a two-part section to our Sunday morning service. The first part of our service, we do a quick devotional. And we are currently doing a survey of the entire Bible starting in Genesis. And then we take a 10-minute break and we come back and we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of First John. And we're now concluding First John in chapter 5. But now we are looking at the second part of the book of Genesis. If you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. And we're looking at the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. In our current study, we are looking at what it means to live by faith. Abraham is a believer who had many obstacles and many challenges to his faith in Genesis. So we are looking at the life of Abraham and where his life is recorded in Genesis 12 through 25. But in preparation for our study of Abraham's life, we've been, this is our second week in the life of Abraham, but in preparation, I want you to go to Colossians chapter two, verse six. Hopefully you don't get cramps in your hand because I'll, I like to go a lot of different places around the, in the Bible because the Bible speaks for itself. In Colossians 2, verse 6, could I get a volunteer to read, please? Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Amen. How did we receive Christ Jesus? We received him at salvation by grace through faith. We received him by faith alone. So here in verse six, Paul tells us, just as you have received him, so walk in him. And what he's talking about here is we receive salvation by grace through faith. We took God at his word that if we believe in his son, Jesus Christ, that we will receive eternal life. So the promise was that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we will receive eternal life. We took God at his word at salvation. And now Paul said, now walk in him. Now live by that same faith. In other words, our lifestyle should be a moment by moment decision to take God at his word. That's what he mean here when he say, just as you have received him, walk in him. In other words, the word walk here is the Greek word peripateo, and it means to live. It means to live. So live in him. In other words, how do I live in Jesus when I live and walk by faith? Now that we are saved as believe in Jesus Christ, we're to live by the same faith that Abraham lived by in Genesis. We are to learn God's promises as he reveals it in the word of God. Remember, I told you before that the Bible has about 7,000 promises made to believers in Jesus Christ. So you got a lot of memorizations to do for a lifetime. But those promises is so important. I know for me, about 20 years ago, when I learned this principle, it changed my life. Learning God's promises will give you stability mentally to get through any trial, any adversity that you will ever endure in this life. We are to learn God's promises and take him at his word. Y'all remember the faith rest drill. 
I got to put Lando on the spot because he gave me another uh, he gave me another uh, uh, point here in my faith rest drill. Remember the faith rest drill. Every time you face a problem as a believer, there are seven things that you must do. The first thing you must do as a believer is to recall to your mind a promise that God made you in his word. But you cannot recall something to mind if you have not spent in quality time in the word of God. So the first thing you do is to recall to your mind a promise from the Bible. Actually, the Holy Spirit, if you've been studying, is going to bring to your remembrance a promise that God made you in his word when you're dealing with problems. That's his way of escape. And once you claim that promise, the second thing you do, you claim that promise by faith. You take God at his word. God said it. I believe it. Three, you shift your attention from concentrating on the circumstance and the problem. You start concentrating on who and what God is. You start thinking about his integrity and his character, like sovereignty, love. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. God is everywhere. God is truth. He's faithful to do what he says he's going to do. So what I'm doing now is I'm shifting my attention from concentrating on my problem, and I'm now concentrating on God who can solve my problem. So by now, my problems are starting to shrink <laughs> because now I'm concentrating on how big God is. And then fourth, this is Lando the future pastor, <laughs> apply this knowledge to experience. I do a devotional with Lando class on Friday and, uh, and I asked him, what is the next step to the favorite drill when I put number three? And he said, apply knowledge to experience. And that was perfect. I said, I'm gonna add that in there. I didn't even have that one. So in other words, I am to take all that knowledge that I have of God's word and that knowledge I have of God's character, and I need to apply it to this circumstance. See, a lot of us, we have a lot of head knowledge, but we don't apply that knowledge to experience so we don't grow. We don't grow. And then fifth, now you relax. Calm down. It's gonna be okay. Don't pull all your hair out your head. <laughs> And when you relax, what you have, you have a peace that surpasses all human comprehension. You're able to rejoice and have happiness even in the midst of adversity. As a believer, you should be happy all the time. Your happiness should never depend on whether circumstances are good or bad. But the only way to have God's happiness no matter what the circumstance, you got to know God's word. That's the foundation of your faith. Because the Holy Spirit will use that knowledge to give you the strength you need to endure trials and adversity. The Christian life will never be a rose garden. I would like it to be, but it's never going to be a rose garden. And now I got peace. And then seven. Wait on the Lord and be obedient as you wait. Now it's time to just wait. Remember, I always like to use my popcorn. Get you some popcorn and put your move in and just relax. Like nothing is wrong. That is the faith rest drill. That is the drill that you use when you face problems. And you can always have God's inner happiness. I remember... I don't been through so much in my life and, and I have used this principle. I have used this principle. What is a promise that I use? Roman 8, 28. For we know that God calls in all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his predetermined plan. If I have a lifestyle of loving God, that scripture tells me that God's gonna take the bad and the good and he's gonna work it all up together and bring about something good. When Grandma and Becky cooked those uh, lemon cakes, she used all the ingredients. If you taste that flour by itself, 
It is disgusting. <laughs> or try some vanilla flavor by itself. <laughs> but once you mix all the ingredients together and put it in the oven, put it in some heat, the heat is the trial. And bring it out and put some icing on it. <laughs> it is good. That's what God does. He take the good and the bad in the life of the man or the woman who have a lifestyle of loving him through their obedience. And he bring about something fantastic and delicious. Uh, what is the Spanish way of saying delicious? What is it? There you go. Let's go back to Hebrew chapter 11, verse 6. Go to Hebrew 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. In Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please God without living by faith. If you're not living by faith, you're not living a life that is pleasing to God. In verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So now I am to live by faith knowing that God is a rewarder for those who diligent seek him. In spite of what I'm going through in my life, if I seek God and I am seeking him through seeking his word so I may know him and obey him, he is a rewarder for those who diligent seek him. So I can relax and I can trust and wait on God to solve my problems. Let's go back to Hebrew chapter, I mean, not Hebrew. Uh, let's go to Genesis 12. Hebrews chapter 12. So Abraham was given promises. And in verse one through three, we see the promises that Abraham was given. And I don't have uh, a whole lot of time to go back through all these promises, but I'm going to mention them. There in verse 1 through 3, we see that the first promise he was given, I will make you a great nation. I will give you a land. I will give you a kingdom. I will bless you. I will make your name great, where you will be highly regarded, and your name will be meaningful in all ages to come. You shall be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curse you, I will curse. Nation will be judged for their treatment of the nation Abraham father. And then seven, verse four, I mean, the last part of verse three, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in other words, here God promised that people from every nation will be blessed through Abraham. And here in this last promise, in verse three, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It is in this promise that God earlier promised in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, would be kept. So God making this promise to Abraham that through him, I'm going to bring blessing to all the nation would actually God keeping a promise that he had made Adam and Eve when he promised that the seed of the woman would defeat sin and death. God in his grace right here with these promises is establishing a relationship with Abraham. This is called the Abrahamic covenant. And it is a covenant of grace. What that means is that the fulfillment of this covenant is not dependent on Abraham's action, but is dependent on God's action. God told Abraham in verse one to leave his home and his family and follow me to a land which I will show you. Abraham was faithful in that he obeyed God. He looked at verse four. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. So his obedience right here demonstrate his faith in God. He took God at his word. He trusted God here. But he trusted God initially, but he must continue to trust God and live by faith because he in store for a lot of obstacles in his life. Just like you and I, 
We trust Christ at salvation, but we must continue to trust him because there will be many obstacles in the Christian life. Abraham had some weaknesses, just like many of us have weaknesses. And he failed after a great victory. In verse four, this was a great victory for Abraham. Taking God at his word was a great victory. But you have to be careful because after a great victory can come a fall. But then later what we're gonna see, Abraham is not gonna trust God to protect him from the Egyptian. Here's the deal. No one can take your life without God's permission. So what Abraham gonna do as he feared his life, he gonna lie about his wife being his sister. He will face as we all will face, as we will see, obstacle to his faith, the temptation to live in fear and in your emotion rather than to live in faith. We all face that every day. We can either choose to think and be emotional in a crisis or we can choose to think God's promises and think who and what God is. A lot of us, we make the choice. Don't you know stress is optional? It's something that we choose to be because God made promises in his word, which reveal his plan, which reveals that we have a future. We have a hope in spite of our circumstance. But we choose not to take God at his word. We are choosing to be emotional. We're choosing not to think in the midst of a problem. And it neutralize our ability to think rationally. When you're in your emotion, emotions, you cannot think rationally. A person who is afraid cannot think rationally, cannot make rational decisions. Is always our choice. So let's look at seven, uh, well, 12 obstacles to Abraham's faith on his journey. 12 obstacles that Abraham encountered in his faith journey. Remember, what was the first obstacle as we learned last week? In verse 30, look at verse 30 of chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 30, here's his first obstacle. His first obstacle was Sariah, his wife, was barren and incapable of producing an heir. But remember, God promised that the seed of the woman would defeat sin and death. So if Sariah, his wife, is barren, it's going to take faith. It's going to take taking God at his word, believing that Sarah's, Sarah, uh, Sariah being barren do not limit God's ability to do what he said he's going to do. It seemed like an impossible circumstance, but that don't limit God's power. We should never limit God's power based on how difficult the circumstance looked. He spoke creation just by into existence, just spoke a word. The second challenge to his faith is going to be after verse 7. Look at verse 7 of chapter 12. Kara, sit up and pay attention. Verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendant, I give this land. So God shows Abraham this land and said, I'm going to give this land to your, you and your descendants. But watch this. That's a, now he's going to face a test. Look at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. So Abraham leave the promised land. Now, this was a land that God had told him that he would inherit. But he leave. Here we see Abraham backsliding. He was a hero earlier. Now he has been a coward. He's been a coward. In other words, the temporary circumstance of the famine in the land challenged or put a test to his faith, to see whether he's going to trust God or not. God just told you, I'm going to give you this land. Don't allow the famine to drive you or cause you in fear to go your own way or plan your own path. 
He did not trust God to provide for him in the crisis. How many of us have done that? Is that when a crisis happened, we know God's promise, but instead of taking God his word, uh, taking God at his word, we go down our own path trying to solve our own problem. God's plan would not be twatted for our life, no matter the circumstance. Go to Isaiah 56, verse 10. Isaiah 56, verse 10 and 11. One of my favorite verses on the sovereignty of God. Isaiah 56, verse 10 and 11. This is God speaking. Verse 10, is God say, for, I, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the soil and bread to the eater, so will my word be which go forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sinned. So God is, um, Isaiah 55, no, I'm sorry. It's 55, verse 10 through 11. Let's go back. We got to go back. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. Verse 10, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the soil and bread to the eater. So will my word be with gold forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I send it. So what God is saying here, I am the sovereign creator. I have, I am the head muncho in charge. I am the creator of the universe and everything serves my purpose. Therefore, if I have spoken a word or gave you a promise, nothing or no one can thwart that promise that I have made you. So Abraham here had a great victory earlier, but now a great fall. He failed to trust God to take care of him in a crisis. In spite of the promise that God had made him, he would act without praying. You know what he should have been doing? He should have got, he should have went into his press service. He should have had a prayer meeting. That's what he should have had. He should have, he should have, uh, you know, thought of God's plan in that situation for his life. But he will act without praying and he will plan his own course of action. He should have stopped to think and pray. This would have given him guidance in the crisis. He will also become a coward through fear. But God's promise to him earlier should have gave him courage toward man and courage toward these circumstances. Fear makes all of us cowards in the face of man and circumstance. We choose not to think God's promises as Abraham was choosing not to think God's promising and God's faithfulness. And we miss out on great peace when we fear. Abraham would go down to Egypt in what? In fear. So what that means? He's walking in the flesh. He's out of fellowship with God. His life was in, and then when he went down to Egypt, when he went down to Egypt, and I'm going to close with this, this point, when he went down to Egypt, Kara, when he went down to Egypt, his life was in danger. So what did he do? Let's read it. Go, go back to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to read here and then we'll uh, make a couple of comments and we'll take a break. Okay. Uh, verse 11. It came about when he came near to Egypt. Now remember, he's out of fellowship that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. 
it came about when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very, very beautiful. So Abraham, in fear, put his wife's life in danger, who would carry the promised seed of redemption, because redemption will come through uh, Sariah. Abram would go back to the beginning. What we're going to find out is that right here, his progression spiritually is going to come to a stop. Why? Because he in fear. He's out of fellowship with God. He's a, he of, and later we're going to see that Abraham will go back to the beginning after he fall along with an Egyptian maid, as we will see later. Where did he start? Well, in verse 7 through 9 of chapter 12, he started in the house of God. He started in the house of God. He was living by faith at that point. But then fear hindered his progression spiritually, and he had to start all over again. <laughs> if you, if you, in chapter 13, 1 through 3, we see he come right back to the place where he had strong faith at. See, if we don't pass the test that God allowed to come in our life, what you have to do when you don't pass the test? You got to go take it again. His progression to the promised land came to a halt in fear. But now it's time to progress. We're going to see later. Abraham's spiritual progress would hinder when he was enslaved. I love that song we just sung. I'm no longer enslaved to fear. I wish that were the case for all of us. But he was hindered from progressing when he was enslaved to his emotion, fear and worry. However, he's going to return in chapter three, one through three, to the place of blessing. So he's gonna recover his faith. So I wanna say this, living by faith is the place to be blessed by God. And if we're not living by faith, taking God at his word, it hinder our progression to enjoying the promises that God have made us in his word. We all have failed at this at times to trust God promises and it neutralizes our spiritual progression through fear. I encourage you to know God's promises. Think his promises, believe his promises, apply his promises so that you can experience the rest that God wants you to experience. And then you patiently wait on God and be obedient while you're doing it. Let us pray. Father, we're just so grateful for your word, which gives us many magnificent promises so that we can have peace in our life. Peace we all at times fail to experience when we choose not to trust you and live by faith. I pray that you will help all of us here this morning to live by faith and never limit your ability to solve our problem because the circumstance seems so difficult. Let us not fail as Abraham failed, but let us succeed as he succeeded in the beginning when he talked to you at his word. I pray that every believer would never limit your power to what they go through. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. Amen. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing of the son of the soul and the spirit and the joint to the marrow and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If you will, open the word of truth to 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, and we are resuming our study of the sin unto death, 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 through 17, 1 John 5, verse 16 and 17, 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, we're doing a study on the sin unto death, 
And we'll start at verse 16 and 17 again. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is a sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Just for the sake of uh, you guys who are joining us for the first time, we had a theme for First John, and that theme was intimacy with fellowship with God and intimacy with Christ. We're learning how to have a more intimate, close walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. That was our theme. And so here in verse 16 and 17, we see that we as Christians are to pray for believers who are committing sins that are not leading to death. We're not just to pray for our own personal needs, but we also are to pray for the need of our brethren in Christ. And the brethren in Christ that is in need right here of prayer is the believer who have went negative toward God and God's word. We all should be concerned about believers who have went negative toward God and his word. Obedience to God is what we are all called to. And we are not just to be concerned about our obedience, but we're to be concerned about the obedience of every Christian. But as you look around you in church history and also in uh, uh, people you know that are believers, there is a lot of there are a lot of believers who are negative toward God's word for whatever reason. It is God's will that you and I experience an abundant life. It is also His will that every believer experience an abundant life. So we are to pray for the recovery of any believer who are negative toward God's word because they are risking dying the sin unto death when they are negative toward God's word. How much do you pray for the recovery of a believer you know is negative toward God instead of sitting around passing judgment are gossiping about that believer. See, loving the believer means that we pray for him when he is negative toward God's word and his life, meaning he have abandoned God altogether for a lifestyle of sin and rebellion. But a lot of time, instead of us praying for that believer, we gossip. We gossip. And what we don't realize is that when we gossip, we're actually sinning too. And so here it is, we're gossiping about a believer who is out of fellowship with God, going his own way through a life of sin and rebellion. He's out of fellowship, but then we gossip about that person, and now we're out of fellowship. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, some of the discipline that God was going to give that believer, he gave it to you <laughs> because you're out of fellowship when you're gossiping. In 1 Timothy 2, 1, Timothy tells us, I mean, Paul tells the young pastor Timothy that they're to pray for the needs of all believers. We're to pray for all believers. And what believers are we to pray for here in verse 16? We're to pray for the believer who are habitually as a way of life, living in sin and rebellion against God. Why? Because the believer who is habitually living in sin and rebellion can possibly face the sin unto death. This believer have not just committed a single sin. We're not talking about a believer who just mess up on occasion. We're talking a believer who mess up and never get back up. A believer who mess up, never confess his sin to God. He go negative toward learning and applying God's word and just abandon himself to a lifestyle of sin and rebellion. That's the belief we're talking about. This believer have abandoned himself to a life of sin. 
Sin still bring about death. Even though you are saved and I am saved by grace through faith, I cannot lose my salvation. You cannot lose your salvation if you believe in Jesus Christ. But sin still bring about death. So what I want to talk to you about, first of all, this morning, I want to talk to you about the different deaths in the Bible. See, when you think of death, you think of the end of existence. In the Bible, death never means the end of existence. The word death in the Bible simply means separation from and the inability to function in a particular realm. Death means separation from or the inability to function in, the, in a particular realm. The first death, I want to give you seven different deaths in the Bible. The first death is called spiritual death. Spiritual death is separation from God as a result of Adam's sin. Remember, in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam a command. He told him that if you eat from the tree that I forbid you from eating from, you will die. He wasn't talking about physical death. He was talking about spiritual death. See, Adam and Eve enjoyed close, intimate fellowship with God when there was no sin. But then they sinned. And when they sinned, they received a sinful nature. That nature in us that tempts us to sin, serve self, and live life independent of God. We all have that nature. So once he received that nature, he became spiritually separated from a holy God. So he cannot interact or function in the realm that God is in. He is spiritually dead. And he passed that sin nature to all of his descendants. We all in here are descendants of Adam and we're all born with Adam's sin nature. Therefore, we're all born spiritually dead and separated from God. That is spiritual death. But through Christ, we receive spiritual life. The second death in the Bible, the first one is spiritual death, which is separation from God. The second death is called positional death. Now this death is separation from sin and the sin nature. And that happens the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, God's spirit comes to live in you, set you apart from your old sin nature, place you in Christ, and now you have spiritual life. You have been made spiritually alive. That is positional death. So in other words, your sin nature do not have domination over you no more because you have been separated from the power of the sin nature the moment you believe in Jesus and the spirit of God comes to live in you. And you can see that in Romans chapter six, verse one through four. And then a third type of death is called temporal death. Now, temporal death is separation from fellowship with God or intimacy with God. Every time we sin as a Christian, we enter temporal death. So every time you and I sin, we enter temporal death. In James 1, verse 10, uh, 15, go to James 1, verse 15, speaking of temporal death. James chapter 1, verse 15. James 1, 15 reads, look at verse uh, 13. Let's look, look at 13 through uh, 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So this is a reference to temporal death. So the, when I sin as a believer and what I think and what I say or when I, what I do, at that moment, I am separated from fellowship with God. I don't lose my relationship with God but I lose fellowship with God. So I'm not controlled by the spirit. I am temporarily dead, okay? And then fourth, you have operational death, operational death. And operational death is separation 
of our profession of faith from the practice of our faith. So in other words, we profess that we believe the Bible, but we're never to separate what we believe from our practice. But when we separate what we believe from our practice, then we are in operational death. That's when um, uh, James said uh, in James 2.26, he say, uh, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So in other words, if I'm not practicing what I believe, then my faith is dead. It's not going to do me any good because I have separated what I believe from my practice. When I separate what I believe from my practice, it does no good for me. It does not help me grow spiritually. You can have all the knowledge of God's word, but if you don't apply it, it would do you no good. It is dead. And then fifth, we have sexual death. Sexual death. Now, sexual death is the inability to function sexually. And we all gonna get there one day and we stay alive long enough <laughs> when you're not gonna be able to have children. But that is called, and all that is a result of, of sin. Sexual death is the inability to function sexually. Romans 4, verse 19 through 20. And Hebrew 11, 11 and 12. Sarah, remember we read about sexual death in um, Genesis uh, chapter 11, verse 30, when it says Sarah was barren. That is sexual death. She did not have the ab uh, ability to sex uh, function sexually where she can have children. But God had control over that and she was able to have children later. So the doctors may tell you that you are sexually dead but God is what? Not dead. <laughs> Six, then we have physical death. Physical death is the separation of our soul and our body. It is the inability to function in the physical realm. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27 say, it is counted for man once to die, but after this come God's judgment. So in other words, when your soul exit your body, you can no longer function in the physical realm, that is physical death. And then lastly, we have the second death. The second death is the judgment of unbeliever in, in, etern uh, in the eternity separated from God in the lake of fire. We see that in Revelation 19 and chapter 20. Unbelievers one day is gonna, if they die, separated from God spiritually by not believing in Jesus, a day is coming where they're going to be separated from God forever in eternity in the lake of fire if they die without believing in Jesus Christ. So what is the death that John is talking about? Well, the death John is talking about refers to temporal death. Now, what is temporal death again? Anybody remember? What is temporal death again? Not in fellowship, being separated from fellowship with God. So not only is this believer... It, now, every time we sin, we're temporarily dead. We're separated from fellowship with God. Therefore, we're separated from that abundant life that God wants to give us. And if we stay in temporary death, what you think going to happen eventually? What you think going to happen eventually? Eventually, we would die physically. Eventually, we would die physically. And also, we experience operational death where because we're separating our faith from our practice. So this believer failed to restore fellowship with God and he's negative toward God's word. The believer's sin has not led him, he hasn't died yet. His sin has not led to physical death. Physical death. So believers in love, so we in love need to pray for every believer that we see going negative toward God's word. We need to pray for them because they're temporarily out of fellowship with God. Believers who are not confessing their sin, but continue to live in it, we need to pray for them instead of gossiping. That's not love. That's not love. This believer allows his sin nature. The believer in temporal death is allowing his sin nature 
to dictate to him how he should live his life. We should never allow our flesh to tell us how we should live our life. But this believer, he allowed his sin nature to dictate how he should live his life instead of allow God's word to dictate to him how he should live his life. Here's the deal. The reason this believer have not died yet is because of the patience of God. God is so patient. He's so long suffering because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for the sins of the world. God allowed a great amount of sin in his patience. Sometimes I know you wonder, how come God allowed that believer that is sinning so much to remain alive so long? And then you got this other believer that have not sinned as much as these believers, yet God allowed them, it's called grace. It's called grace. God is showing them patience and grace. But at some point, God will judge. And when the judgment come on believers who live out of fellowship with God, rejecting his grace, when it comes, it will come swift. The sin nature, I mean, the sin of the dead is a mean by which the believer who have reverted back to his old lifestyle of sin and rebellion is transferred from time into eternity. Because God is not going to sit back and just watch his children miss out on the abundant life that he has for them on earth. He'll rather bring you on to glory than to sit here and watch you just miss out on the happiness and the blessing he has for those who love him. And so he will call you home. He will call you home. Go to Psalm 118, 7 through 18. Psalm 118, verse 17 and 18. Verse 17 and 18, I would not die but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has dissed me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Who you think the psalmist is here? David. So in other words, David was disciplined by God for what he did. And y'all know what he did. He had sex with this man's wife and he committed murder. But God showed him grace and forgave him and all David wanted to do now is just proclaim the works of God. He just wanted to praise God for his grace. He said, I would not die. He said, you disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. So David went through different stages of God's discipline. He didn't get to that, that, that ultimate stage, which is the sin of death. He was warned by God. He ignored the warning. Then God intensified his discipline. That's when God takes something that you really, really love. He takes something that really, really something that maybe you have idolized. And then, or he allow it to be taken. Let me just say it like that, because really, most of everything that happens to us is a result of sin. I want you to think that it's God. God just allowed sin's consequence to have its consequence. But he used it to serve his purpose, which is always blessing in the sky. But we got three types of discipline for a believer who have turned his back on God and have went negative. I'm not talking about believers that occasionally sin. The one who sin and don't confess, but just choose to just live out of fellowship with God and never grow up spiritually. He warns that believer first. The warning is like a real mild like um, discipline. And I give y'all what I'm talking about. When my, when my little, uh, little uh, my, I have an older son. When he was young, I used to use a little small ruler. I used to tap him on the on his on his leg here when I need for him to respond and do what he's supposed to be doing. Or if I don't listen for everything, but it's after I give a command and they and they go against that command, that's rebellion. So I want to help you restrain your old sin nature. <laughs> so it's called discipline. Because if I don't help you restrain your old sin nature, it's gonna destroy you in the life that God has for you. Some of us don't like to do that to our children, but you better save them from that old situation by discipline. And, and I spanked them on, 
But as they got older, you realize that the ruler don't even work anymore. Then I went to the belt when he got older. And then I had to graduate from the belt because the belt wasn't getting the response that I needed. <laughs> so I, so God made it so convenient. Across the street from my house was a tree that had some beautiful little switches. <laughs> Let me tell y'all something. A switch anywhere on a bare body would get a response that a belt cannot get. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When I spank, when I hit my son across his leg with that switch, you're talking about humility. I didn't have to ask him to do anything. He was coming to me every day, Dad, is there anything you want me to do? <laughs> it don't give me joy to discipline my children, but my love for them motivate discipline because I know he has an old sin nature I have to help him restrain the old sin nature or he's going to destroy him and God's plan for his life. And some people say, oh, that's abusive. Actually, it's abusive if you don't discipline your children because you're going to put them on a path of destruction. You're not helping them restrain their old sin nature. It's not easy as a parent. It hurt me to, can you imagine spanking the little beautiful little girl? <laughs> I, I, it hurts me. And I actually, they laughed because they said, after you dismal, you preach to us because I wanted to know that I love you. I don't never want them to, you know, associate discipline with not loving you. But anyway, so God have to discipline us in warning and intensive phase. The warning is just a mild light discipline, but if we ignore the warning, then he have to allow something a little bit more painful. Do he enjoy doing it? No, he don't. But his love for you motivates him to do it because he's not gonna sit back and watch you destroy yourself or allow your sin nature to destroy you because he has so much more for you as a believer. Actually, there is so much, so many blessings in an escrow account. In other words, it's already yours, but a lot of us don't even enjoy those blessings because we stay out of fellowship all the time. And we don't stay in fellowship long periods. Of so then if you ignore the warning, probably 20, 30, 40 years, then at some point, God has to judge and he'll call us home. He removed, when he removed a believer from this earth, that is called maximum discipline from God. And what is the consequence there? That believer died without any peace. He died without any peace. The believer who lived his entire Christian life out of fellowship with God, running the way of the world, going his own way, he died without peace. God wants us to have dying grace. He wants us to die peacefully. And the only way to die peacefully is constantly stand in fellowship with God. Not that you're not going to fail. You're going to fail, but confess your sin when you fail. Get back in fellowship with God. Don't stay out of fellowship for long periods of time. Because when you confess your sin, that shows that you love God and that you don't want to hurt the heart of God. So you know that you need to confess. It is painful and horrible, miserable death, as well as a loss of blessing in time and eternity. The sin unto death is a miserable way to leave this earth. I don't want to leave out of fellowship with God because it's no telling how I'm going to leave this earth if I'm out of fellowship with God when I leave. Though this believer died miserably in time, here's the blessing in all that. Though he may die miserably in time for choosing to turn his back on God, he would not be miserable in heaven. And that's grace. That is praise the Lord. However, the sin nature, the, I mean, the sin unto death is God's last expression of discipline to the believer out of fellowship habitually. Not talking about a believer who mess up. And don't, and don't get me wrong. God is not sitting back waiting for you to mess up. No, he knows you're going to mess up, but he wants you to utilize what he has made for you to get back in fellowship when you mess up. He wants you to use for John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and clean up from all unrighteousness. 
He knew you was going to fail because he didn't take your sin nature away yet until you get your resurrection body. But he wants you to confess it and, and stay positive toward learning his word. And as he make his will known, line your life up with his will. That's what he wants. Why? Because he wants to bless you. And he wants to bless you. The believer who you can't identify as a believer is a believer who are in temporal death. All of us should be identified. Be a, people should be able to identify that we are Christians. If they can't identify that there's something different about us, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. But a believer out of fellowship with God thinks, believe, and act like an unbeliever, or a believer on his way to the sin of to death, he think and act like an unbeliever. You can't even really tell that he is a believer at all. What is the cause of the sin unto death? And I'm going to close with this. What is the cause of the sin unto death? It is habitual sin and as a way of life, failure to grow up spiritually. Go to Jeremiah 9, verse 13 through 16. Jeremiah 9, verse 13 through 16. Jeremiah 9, 13 through 16. Failing to grow up spiritually is a reason why this believer faces sin unto death. Verse 13 say, the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my board, nor walked according to it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart and after the balls as their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus say the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them this people with warm wood and give them poison water to drink. I will scatter them among the nation whom neither they nor their father have known. And I will send the sword after them until I have, excuse me, annihilated them. So here God say the reason is they went negative. They became very negative toward God's word. That's the reason God called believers home early because they went negative toward his word. They had abandoned themselves to a life of sin and idolatry. And so, but God had been patient for a long time. And so here's the reason. So the call is a rejection and neglect of God's word in their life. Go to Jeremiah, got two minutes. Go to Jeremiah 44, 12. Jeremiah 44, 12. Jeremiah 44, 12. Somebody read, if you will. What we see here is that God will use many means to cause these believers to face the sin unto death. But if you look, it's all because they have went negative. In Philippians 3, 18 and 19, Paul will say that the believer out of fellowship set their minds on earthly things rather than spiritual things. And I will close with Revelation 3, 15 through 16 with the lukewarm believer, all right? Let's go to Revelation 3, 15 through 16, and we will start with Revelation 3, 15 to 16. In Revelation 3, verse 15 through 16, here we see the, uh, 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 what it means to be a lukewarm believer. Verse 15, uh, let's start at verse yeah, 15. It says, I know your deed that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now he is talking to believers. Believers who are lukewarm believers. See, lukewarm in, in the Christian life leads to the sin and to death. First, it leads to temporal death, getting out of fellowship with God. Lukewarm is when there is 
little or no enthusiasm toward the things of God. When you see a believer that don't have, they're not real enthusiastic about the things of God, that is a lukewarm believer. <laughs> they are indifferent to God's word. They show no interest in the word of God, in the plan of God, but they go their own way in the way of the world. This believer, through the sin unto death, will face the sin unto death if he don't change his attitude toward God and his word, but he won't lose his salvation. Some would say that the brethren in view here will neither say because they are, uh, um, you know, not excited about the things of God. Just because a believer is not excited about the things of God don't mean that that believer was never saved. Believers can get to a point in their life where they lose interest in the things of God because of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So I encourage you, when we come back, we're going to look at some, some more examples of the sin unto death. I got my five or six other examples of the sin unto death. And so we're told in 1 John that we're to pray. If you know any believer that have went negative toward God's word, we're told that we need to be praying for their recovery because they're on their way to losing out on fantastic blessing that God has in store for them. And you as a Christian, you're to protect yourself um, uh, from missing out on that life that is abundant. How? By confessing your sin anytime you fail and stand positive toward learning and applying the word. Do not lose interest in God's word. Do not lose interest in applying the word. Let it be said that you are a Christian. We should be identified amongst the world. Let's start right here. Any questions or comment for me? Any questions or comment? No question or comment? Y'all are some good students. Thank y'all for coming today. And with that being said, let's spend a few moments in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful for your love for us and your patience. We all mess up, we all fail. And we know that you don't get joy out of discipline us. All you want from us, Lord, is just to be in your plan so that you can bless every area of our life. Help us to never question your love through what you allow to come in our life to keep us on track. We thank you for discipline that you give us for our good. But Father, I pray for every believer here that they will never experience the sin unto death. But I pray that they would die peacefully. And the only way that's possible is you protect them and deliver them from evil and deliver them from temptation. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.